I think the public of Australia is almost to a point of outrage at the fact that the government has abandoned uh, Julian Assange. But let's also think about the importance of what Assange is doing. I think one of the reasons that Australians generally think Assange is a hero and the government have betrayed him, the reason is because he has cast a light into some of the dark corners of what governments get up to when they think no one's watching. You know, if governments recently have been embarrassed by the leaks that Julian Assange has assisted, uh, if they want to avoid being embarrassed by that, maybe they need to learn to stop doing embarrassing things. It will be to the great benefit of our country if governments reckon that there is a fair prospect that their bad behaviour will one day be exposed. Um, the, uh, the very important thing which was said about um, free speech and truth in government was said a very long time ago by Wendell Phillips and a lot of people know a bit of what he said but not everyone remembers the full thrust of what he said and it's this and this is what WikiLeaks is all about. Wendell Phillips said in, I think, 1852, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Power is ever stealing from the many to the few. The hand entrusted with power becomes the necessary enemy of the people. Only by continual oversight can the Democrat in office be prevented from hardening into a despot. Only by unintermittent agitation can a people be kept sufficiently awake to principle not to let liberty be smothered by material prosperity. That's a truth which was as valid then as it is now. We seem to have forgotten altogether how important it is that governments be held to account for their own conduct. Now, one of the interesting ways of testing this is uh, something that happened, I think it was on Tuesday. Um, what happened to the WikiLeaks site was that PayPal and MasterCard stopped facilitating payments to WikiLeaks. Now, we know from this morning's news that PayPal were pressured by the American government to withdraw their service from WikiLeaks. MasterCard, so far as I'm aware, have not yet declared their hand. Um, I'm prepared to bet that the CIA was behind it, and if anyone would like to prove me wrong, I'd be fascinated to hear it. <laughs> But we won't know for some while if we ever learn the truth of why it is that those uh, organisations suddenly withdrew from supporting WikiLeaks or rather providing their commercial services to WikiLeaks. If we are ever to find out, it will be because an organisation like WikiLeaks reveals it to us. And in that simple proposition, you understand just how important it is that WikiLeaks exists and how vital it is that we should all of us express our support for the organisation generally and for Julian Assange specifically. Thank you. I'd now uh, like to call upon Peter Gordon, who's a principal at Gordon Legal. Uh, you'll all remember him, of course, from the um, work class actions that Peter did with um, Wittenoom asbestos workers, more recently the thalid thalidomide cases. Um, and has, um, again, one of those people that have championed the cause of working people, Peter Gordon. Um, thanks, Rob. I, I want to endorse what, uh, what Julian has said and both of the key themes that he um, um, adopted, but I want to focus on something else which I think has been, um, which I guess is a spin-off of, of the second point that Julian was making, which I think ought to be of increasing concern to uh, people in Australia and, and lawyers in particular, and that is the war on information which appears to be being waged by big governments and big corporations today. Um, when I suggested to Rob, as I did on the weekend, that a meeting like this ought to be organised, um, I was very <coughs> pleased that he organised it and, and was happy to agree to his re request to speak. When we had that conversation, I think on Saturday morning, um, my principal concern about what was going on with WikiLeaks and uh, Julian Assange was the brazen use of money and power by big government, and the US government in particular, and big corporations, to deny access to information. The sight of the most prominent politicians in the world threatening the use and abuse of the criminal law to, publish, to punish a man <coughs> who republished information which was already publicly available and had for some time been accessible to at least three million people has been deeply disturbing to all of us and I guess reflects the, the attendance here tonight as well as a lot of other things. 
We should all reflect, I think, on how any individual would cope with the number of countries calling for his incarceration and the number of politicians calling for his execution and the persecution of his children. The actions and pronouncements of the US government in its broader iteration in the last weeks can, I think, fairly be described as barbaric. The pressure, which as Julianne has indicated, has led to other governments falling into line, into large corporations like PayPal, Visa and MasterCard being gang-pressed gang into secondary boycotts of WikiLeaks is truly frightening to watch. The case is the latest and the biggest example of the increasing preparedness of big government and big corporations to suppress information by the use of its superior access to money and to power. I speak, of course, with some personal involvement in this. I speak as a lawyer who still today is subject to injunctions obtained by a large tobacco company over information and defence of, our case, of a case before the Victorian Supreme Court, the McCabe case. That information was made available by for, former Law Institute President Chris Dale, who believed they revealed criminal conduct. The then DPP agreed and referred the matter to the Australian Crimes Commission. Four years later, that information, that, that ac access to that information is still being held up in the courts on all sorts of pretexts of confidentiality and privilege. The efforts of former Federal Police Commissioner Mick Kelty to have Barrister Stephen Kine punished for publishing the record of interview of Dr Mohammed Anif is another example. In Australia today, it is too hard to access and to legitimately use information when powerful interests don't want you to. Freedom of information laws in this country have become a board game for powerful politicians and their public service. And the promises of whistleblower protection that various politicians have made are honoured more in their absence. We need a legislative regime which properly permits and protects a person, which permits a person to make an ex parte application to a judge, show the, the judge the information, and if the judge is of the view that legitimate issues of public concern are enlivened, the information ought to be disclosed without limitation. That should apply whatever the source of the documents. Too often in recent years, vacuous claims of legal privilege, of confidentiality, of commercial inconfidence, of national security or of diplomacy have masked a much more cynical and indeed sinister motive for keeping information secret. It's time for the law to recognise that even if there is a notional character of privilege or confidentiality or commercial inconfidence or national security, that ought not to be an end to the question. Some information might attract that description, but nevertheless be justified for public release because that interest is outweighed by the public interest in people knowing about it. I'm not talking about <coughs> private rights or information here. What happens in politicians' private lives is really <coughs> no, of no interest to me and none of our business. But the information that our most recent former Prime Minister was suggesting military options against China to the US Secretary of State is not a matter about which he has a right to privacy. And let's just pause for a minute to consider what the idea of using force against China actually means. <laughs> the only issue of national security and diplomacy which arises in that context for me is, do I want a person like that expressing those views to the US Secretary of State to be my country's foreign minister? That was my principal concern a week ago. Since then, as Julian has said, We've seen the depressing spectacle of a Labor government aiding and abetting the persecution of this man by the United States. It seems clear to me that midway through yesterday, the Australian government either perceived the backlash and realised the error of its ways or decided its participation in these heavy-handed tactics was counterproductive. But that change, welcome if it is to be sustained, shouldn't lead us to ignore the completely unacceptable pronouncements of our Prime Minister and our Federal Attorney-General in labelling Assange's conduct illegal when there is no evidence of that and in promoting the persecution of him. Now, I know Julia Gillard and I know Rob, Rob, Rob McClellan. I've worked with both of them. They've been good lawyers and they are decent people. That positions of power can lead them to act in the way that they have is a salutary lesson to all of us in the seductive and compulsive draw of power. In the last two days, again, as Julian has said, a new concern emerges for me. That's been that we've learned through WikiLeaks that Special Minister of State Mark R. Bibb has been supplying secret information to the United States that he would never have dreamed of disclosing to us, to the Australian public, that elected him. And that Foreign Minister Kevin Rudd, apparently in pursuit of what he regards as expert specialist diplomacy, enlivened the use of military force by the USA against China. 
You know, I used to resent Kevin Rudd when it seemed that his life consisted just of a series of tater tates and photo opportunities with Kate Blanchett and Bono and Russell Crowe. Now I devoutly wish that that was all he did. <laughs> the revelation of this conduct by our most senior politicians is extremely disturbing. In my opinion, it elevates, again, as Julian has said, the importance of the public's access to the material WikiLeaks is disclosing. I think we all ventured into this process concerned that maybe something would be revealed which genuinely threatened the safety of people or the security of, of countries. And who knows, maybe that will still happen. But so far, nothing like that has come. Instead, we've learned some appalling and some important things about the activities of senior people in our government and the activities of other governments. We do need to know what WikiLeaks is able to tell us. If one compares from a moral perspective what WikiLeaks has done and is doing with the conduct that's been revealed by people like the US government, by people like the governments of Libya, by people like the, the royal family of the Saudis, by Kevin Rudd, by Mark Arbib, it ought to tell us something about what the law ought to be doing from a jurisprudence point of view. When you look at those comparative conducts, what sort of conduct ought the law be seeking to proscribe and encourage? It ought to be about protecting and enhancing the role of WikiLeaks and weakening the ability of politicians to do what's been disclosed. Thank you very much.